It's my great pleasure to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Benjamin Uderman, who's a cardiac thoracic surgeon with aortic um, specialty uh, with advanced training in endovascular and aortic surgery. He completed his training with a fellowship in endovascular and thoracic aortic surgery at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia after completing his cardiothoracic surgery and general surgery training. Dr. Uderman has extensive experience across all aspects of cardio cardiac surgery, including on and off pump coronary artery bypass grafting, mitral valve repair, and aortic valve repair, including TIVR, trans catheter aortic valve replacement. His aortic specialty practice include uh, aortic valve sparing techniques and complex reconstruction repair of the aortic valve and the aorta. This includes open and endovascular aortic repair using the latest technology of branch grafts and furniture endovascular grafts. His special interest is in rich stratification of patients and families with aortic disease. Let's please welcome Dr. Benjamin Uderman to give us a talk about surgical management of aortic atrial fibrillation related stroke risks. Ablation versus left atrial appendage closure. Ben. Thank you, Tony. Um, apart from my aortic work uh, in recent years since I've been in Maimonides, I've been involved with the surgical approach to atrial fibrillation, which when you do aortic surgery is a blessing in disguise in that the operations that I get to do, sorry. Nobody can hear me? I find that hard to believe. That does happen on occasion. Um, first, I would like to give a shout out to my team that's in the back who makes me incredibly nervous uh, when I see them across the board. I'd like to point out specifically that every single one of them have sat in the aisle in the back. And when I get into the throes of the talk, you will see them peeling off one at a time, holding their phone as though they have an incredibly important text to answer. So I'm just, just you know, we're just going to talk clearly about this. Hello, Joseph. You said I have to advance the slide. So as with everything related to the heart, all of these things are related to the Framingham study. If you don't know the Framingham study, you, pro you probably have not passed your boards multiple times. And the Framingham study was a large scale longitudinal evaluation of patients with heart disease that expanded into vascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, and then I think everything that can possibly relate it to the human body. During this workup of the data that was acquired in the Framingham study, the the fact that atrial fibrillation was an independent risk factor for stroke was clearly elucidated, and subsequently it has been shown to be an independent risk factor for mortality and um, quality of life. The problem with atrial fibrillation is twofold, but the big dramatic one that we're going to really touch on a bunch of times today is thrombus formation in the left atrium. I put the star in the middle of the left atrial appendage so that everybody can see it. Many people in the audience uh, here and abroad, or abroad being not here, um, don't get to see these every day. Of course, uh, our card cardiology colleagues and, and the, the cardiac surgeons see this all the time. But the atrial appendage is just that. It's a little anteroom off of the left atrium that houses nothing. But if it stops contracting, it can have swirling blood that slows down and then can cause thrombus formation. And this is the exact area where clots will form in the overwhelming majority of cases, we believe. Uh, and I'm going to touch on that a number of times. And then these clots can fall off, flick off, break apart, and cause a stroke, because of course, this is on the left side of the body. And this is that we believe very strongly that 90% of the clots are formed in the left atrial appendage. Um, and that if the left atrial appendage was not present, that they would have a significant decrease in stroke in non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And these are all very specific. I'm being very, very specific. The CHAD score was evaluated initially to look at heart failure, hypertension, age, diabetes, and then it's been extended and expanded into the CHADS 2 VASC. I think by the time I retire, which hopefully will be in 12 years, although I just did a renovation on my house. My wife tells me that's been expanded also into about 17 years, but that's a different conversation altogether. But I suspect that this will not be Chad's Vask. I think there'll be about 10 different words associated with this, you know, on and on and on and on. And basically, if you're breathing, 
and you're in atrial fibrillation and you have increasing risk factors for any medical problems, you're going to have increasing risk factors for all kinds of other medical problems, including stroke. Now, how you categorize that and how you choose to define whether you should or should not be on anticoagulation really is why I'm here at this talk. And also because I gave Tony $3,000 and asked him if I could give a talk today. But the reality of it is that if you decrease the risk of atrial fibrillation and you decrease atrial fibrillation and you decrease the locations in the heart where strokes can form, then you decrease the risk of stroke. You can't get it to zero, but it definitely decreases it. So the CHADS VAS score is, is great. It's used to evaluate things. Um, most physicians like to come up with numbers to tell patients, you know, and we're going to talk a little bit about those numbers. But what the conclusion showed by looking at the CHAD, CHAD, chat to d ask score now we're up to all these letters was that as the numbers increase your risk factors increase the chances of you having a stroke increases at least your risk factors what's the risk factor for you having a stroke if you haven't had a stroke zero what's the risk factor for you having a stroke if you've had a stroke 100 percent, right so these are numbers that we tell patients to explain to them why we do the things we do but it does not change their individual outcomes at all they're going to get what they're going to get but this study was done in 21,000 patients so my statistical colleagues tell me that that's a, a high enough power to really pay attention to these numbers so that even if your chads vas score is relatively low your risk of stroke is relatively low but once you get up past five it starts to dramatically increase but the other side of the coin is the most interesting thing is that if you take these patients who are not anticoagulated and you come up with these numbers for their increased risk of stroke, well, once they get to three, four, and five, their, their risk of stroke goes up into the one to two to 3% range. But if you anticoagulate them, this is not a free ride. And the reason that we are in business is because patients will still suffer multiple complicated complications of our treatments, including the anticoagulation for stroke risk, which is why we're, again, having this conversation here today. The impact of, ooh, how do I move this little guy? Can I move this guy? There we go. The impact of um, AFib is well appreciated in the medical community, but it is not appreciated so much that we have options to decrease the impact of AFib because there's multiple aspects of this. There's the anticoagulation, which is the you know, knee-jerk response. There's the stroke, which is if patients cannot tolerate anticoagulation and is often how these patients will present. And then the third thing is the decrease in cardiac function, the efficiency of cardiac function, especially in the hypertensive population. We all know hypertension causes left ventricular hypertrophy, decreases left ventricular compliance. If the atrium then does not contract, then the efficiency of the heart to expel blood out dramatically drops, and people can go into heart failure based on atrial fibrillation in the face of left ventricular hypertrophy. And these are the other parts of atrial fibrillation that are less appreciated and less talked about. But the take home message from this slide is you have more AFib, you have increased mortality. Now, increased mortality is a much different conversation. This is across the board's increased mortality. So how do we get there? Well, we get there by going backwards and saying, okay, well, what if we took the left atrial appendage off and we're doing a bunch of cases in heart surgery, which we do here at Maimonides, and we are just gonna take off the appendage randomly and we're gonna take the appendage off in some patients, but leave it in in others. Well, what happens is, is that if there's no left atrial appendage, there are fewer embolic events. I think most people in the room after my first slide, which said 90% of the clots come from there, would believe that that's true. So every year at the STS, which is the Society for Thoracic Surgeons meeting, there's a hand raise of about a bunch of topics that have been sort of edgy. This is one of the topics that has gone from about five to 10%, how many people take off the left atrial appendage to about 50% of patients that take off the left atrial appendage in patients who have no history of atrial fibrillation and 90% of patients who either have atrial fibrillation preoperatively or in the operating room 
you can imagine when we start poking and prodding and putting needles into the heart and doing stuff, patients can go into AFib. But there is a fundamental difference between patients that go into AFib in the operating room and patients that don't. We don't know what that difference is, but we know there's something different about them. And therefore, a lot of us will just take off the left atrial appendage empirically in those cases. But it's gone up and up and up, and therefore, we've seen fewer bleeding complications because if the left atrial appendage is clipped, then we don't put patients on anticoagulation as early as we otherwise would, and then they, we decrease risk of stroke. So you're following this lead. It's all kind of a little bit soft, but it actually all makes a lot of sense. So let's go back to what's available for atrial fibrillation. Now we're talking about just getting patients out of AFib, decreasing across the board risk. And head-to-head -head studies have been done with atrial fibrillation treated with amiodarone, which is our go-to drug, and catheter ablation. And the catheter ablation has shown that it decreases the um, incidence of atrial tachycardias in these patients, and then it works better than the amiodarone, which has increased you know, uh, tachycardias by comparison. Now, in the last many years, we've got these great monitors we can either stick on patients or put under their skin, um, and we really have a lot of fantastic data coming out because of these things. But the real world data um, is, is, is far more complicated. And that is that if you take these patients and you catheter ablate them, it does improve mortality from atrial fibrillation. But any of us in this room can say that that may or may not be statistically significant, but it's not necessarily the statistical significance that makes you jump up and down and get really excited. When we see the lines diverging after one year straight up and down and they're really, really far apart, we feel good. When they're sort of like parallel, it's like, it's okay. And then we, we try to figure out. So this is what really happens. These are the real numbers. And then I want to draw your attention to this down here, which is something that Felix Yang um, uh, says, said to me, and I, I really appreciated the, his, his analogy. He says, if you take a patient who has atrial fibrillation and you obliterate the atrial fibrillation at the time, however you do it, similar to coronary artery disease, the body, for whatever reason it's developing atrial fibrillation, may continue to develop pathways for atrial fibrillation, and those may continue and circumvent all your efforts. Just like coronary disease, we do bypasses, we put in stents, we do all kinds of cool stuff. Patients still try to get coronary disease in the areas where we do or don't do our work. So in your mindset, you realize, okay, well, that should be borne out in the data, and it actually is. In the ablations, in the first year, second year, third year, by the fourth year, the numbers start to catch up to each other. And that's particularly interesting because you know that the ablation patients are getting best medical treatment, especially in these studies. You're in these studies, you stop taking your medication, you get kicked out. Um, and so it's important to understand, but these are 18,000 patients and 9,000 patients. So these are very, very real numbers. So the maze procedure, which was uh, started many, many years ago, but really modernized um, by the working, uh, the surgeries by Jim Cox in, at St. Louis in, at Barnes Jewish Hospital, where he literally would start to cut along the lines to interrupt the pathways for atrial uh, conduction from the SA node, the sinoatrial node, to the AV node that were alternate pathways. And he went through this complicated gyration. Now, everybody who looks at this thinks that the guy took a pair of scissors, made all the incisions, and then comes back with sutures and sews it all back together. I think in reality, you realize that's not how it's done, right? You make a little cut, you sew behind yourself, cut a little more, sew behind yourself, right? Does that make a lot more sense? The minute I say that, I sort of ruin the, 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 the drama of what you think happened, but this is what really happens. You just sort of cut and sew around behind yourself. And when we do certain operations, we do portions of a cut and sew maze. But really, that has been modernized and advanced to what we now do, which is radio frequency. Um, there are some people that do cryo maze. And basically, the concept of radio frequency or cryo is that you either burn or freeze and injure, causing scarring and, and apoptosis of the wall of the atrium, decreasing the size of the atrium, decrease the number of pathways, and improve the likelihood that the patient stays in atrial fibrillation. And they do, shockingly, but true. Some of the early modifications had to do with the fact that they put these patients in complete heart block. 
which in a way was helpful because then they could put in a pacemaker and then they'd have AV conduction. But of course, then they had to put in a lot of pacemakers. So it wasn't really a win-win because we all know the complications of pacemakers, but we're not talking about that today. So in the modern age, Ralph Damiano, who is an interesting character, if anybody's ever met him, um, is still at uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital and he's been publishing tons of data over the many years since his uh, seminal work with Jim Cox when he was a young pup, as they say. And the increasing competing risks of death and atrial tachycardias are balanced against the cumulative risk of death and complications and atrial fibrillation, as you see, it comes down. So this is the five-year mark, and that's 75%. Now we're at the 10-year mark, we're about 60%. So we're not doing a perfect job. And what are the predictors of recurrence? It's a lot of the things that we already know. Age, chronic lung disease, peripheral vascular disease, preoperative persistent, persistent atrial fibrillation. So you already learned that the more AFib you have, the more AFib you have. Large left atrial size, because the size of the atrium creates a situation where the communication between the two sides of the heart starts to decrease and pathways start to find a more efficient way to get there. The patients have early postoperative AFib after an attempt to eradicate the AFib or they need to be shocked back into sinus rhythm, not as good. And if the patients get discharged in AFib, also not as good, right? These are things that we see every day. We see it all the time. So why don't we open them back up and do this? Well, I'm gonna tell you. Of course, I'm going to tell you. So the indications that we have that brought me here today are cerebral hemorrhage. Now, I was going to make that like flash and jump up and down, Tony, but it actually really dramatically increases the memory. So I decided not to do it because I had to email it to you, um, which really ruined my night last night because most people will work on their presentation right up into the, you know, the, the moments before they have to give it. But you sort of ruined my evening and I had to enjoy my son's birthday instead. I won't tell you how much food I ate and how much ice cream I ate. Cerebral bleeds, GI bleeds, bleeding complications from other causes or frequent falls. My own grandmother died at 102 after not being on anticoagulation for 18 years because of frequent falls in the face of atrial fibrillation. She did not have a left atrial appendage clip and she did develop multifocal dementia, but her falls on balance with the AFib, on balance with the anticoagulation, created a situation where it would be best to not anticoagulate her. Today, she would come in and Dr. Golick and Dr. Mattia would put a left atrial clip on her because it's really weird to operate on your own grandmother. But the point is, is that we have other options today on the patients that age out of anticoagulation. That's not specifically talking about cerebral hemorrhage and these other issues, but it does go to the point of if you can decrease risk, that's what we do in our entire um, career here. So the relative contraindications are left lung surgery. We had a patient the other day who had a um, pneumonia and it took us a few minutes to get into the pericardium. But if the pericardium is free, we'll get there eventually and then we'll put on the clip. Pericardial scarring on the other hand is a whole nother ball game. And if you've got pericardial scarring or prior heart surgery, you cannot do an open surgical clip. The neuroendocrine effects of the left atrial appendage clip, and we're gonna talk about the watchman shortly, have a lot to do with the fact that we all thought for many years that this was just sort of sitting there and we didn't know what it did. Sort of like, you know, the appendix and gallbladder. There's a bunch of other stuff in there, right, Tony? Is this anything in the brain that's extra? You don't know. You said we only use, what, 5% of it? But in my case, four? I, that was really nice of you. Thanks, Tom. Um, no comments out of you, Dr. Levin. Um, <clears throat> and the, the neuroendocrine effects of a left atrial clip are quite dramatic, actually, because we learned that it's a, it's a, it's a neurohumeral effect that the left atrial appendage clip senses the volume in the heart. And if there's a volume in the heart that's too big, it may cause diuresis to decrease the volume in the heart to make it more efficient. So that if you block it, you'll get increasing circulating volume. You'll get decrease of the natural diuresis. You'll get an increased volume, and therefore you'll get an increased blood pressure if the heart can tolerate it. And if it doesn't tolerate it, they go into pulmonary edema, they get reintubated, and then you get yelled at. The point being that you have to know that these patients need increased diuresis 
when they have these conditions as you're treating them. And sometimes as we talk about these patients that are complicated with cerebral bleeds, we have to balance all of this stuff. It's not just the anticoagulation. It's the blood pressure, it's the diuresis, it's the sodium levels, potassium levels. It becomes really complex. For the uninitiated in the audience, this is in fact the heart. Yes, everything is blue and red, just as Dr. Netter pointed out. This is the right atrial appendage. Um, we put a cannula in there and we actually tie off the tip of the right atrial appendage, which does sometimes have an effect. The left atrial appendage is not usually located in this position when you're looking at the patient, because of course the heart is not like that. It's slightly turned to the left and back so that this left atrial appendage is li literally located over here, which is why when we do the procedure, it's on that side. Now, this is one of my favorite studies where they took a CT scan that was done beautifully well. And not only did they characterize all of these different shapes of the left atrial appendage, but they gave them awesome names. Now we do this in the operating room and I was extremely difficult that they didn't use the lobster, which I believe is Dr. Mantia's favorite, the lobster, you know, where it comes out like that, you know, but they did characterize the chicken wing, the cactus, which I really, I've seen a lot of cactuses and a lot of left atria, I don't understand it. The windsock also a little bit lost on me. Cauliflower, I totally understood that one. That was a good one. <clears throat> but if you look at the chicken wing cactus, windsock and cauliflower, and you do an incredibly complicated analysis of blood flow inside of it, you will notice dramatic differences. And then if you go down the line and these patients are in atrial fibrillation and you evaluate them for the incidence of the development of clots, you will see that based on what the appendage looks like, you will have an increased incidence of clots. If you've got a cauliflower, beware. I know this is silly, but it actually has bearing on the reality when we get in there. And when we see patients with extremely complicated left atrial appendixes, and I am thinking about deciding when to put the clip on, and you guys call me that the patient needs to be cleared, and I see that the left atrial appendage is this big complicated thing, I will suggest that earlier than later may be best because the chances of a clot forming is not dramatically different, but it's different enough that if we're going to choose between three months and two months, it sort of makes sense. Because if the left atrial appendage has a clot in it at the time of a minimally invasive left atrial appendage clip surgery, it's not going to get clipped. It will not happen, okay? The factors that lead to the formation of the clots and the embolic events are the presence of atrial fibrillation, the size and shape of it, and the length of time that the patient's been off anticoagulation. But the length of time off anticoagulation, I mean, I have heard people say they don't want patients off anticoagulation for a week or two weeks. These incidences of 2 to 3% risk of stroke are in a year. You can leave patients off anticoagulation four, six weeks after they have these events. They come in, their left atrial appendage are clean. It does matter what the appendage looks like, but it's important to understand patients being off anticoagulation for up to a week prior to surgery and a couple of weeks after a stroke prior to placement of a clip, from our perspective, is fine. But there's a group of patients who we are referred who can actually be anticoagulated from you guys. And we have this conversation, which is extraordinarily nuanced, and we have gotten ourselves into standing in a pile of molasses, where I'm standing across from Tony, who's standing in a pile of molasses, and the family is standing over there going, he said, and then you said, and then he said, and then you said, and we sit there and we're like, it's complicated, because you can anticoagulate these patients, unless they develop a complication of the anticoagulation. That's the most important factor in this next part of the talk. Left atrial appendage occlusion devices and the ablations that we can create to decrease the risk of atrial fibrillation moving forward. So the two parts require anticoagulation for two to three months, okay? The study was 45 days, I say two to three months, because nobody's got the guts to turn it off at 45 days, even in the study. So if you take a patient who you want to block the left atrial appendage and do it minimally invasively, I want you to put in this device. It works, it's beautiful, it's nicely done. The two problems with the device are that 
you can't put it in all of the left atrial appendages, even though you want to, because the shape of this thing has to allow for the device to go in there and stay in there. And I say that specifically as a heart surgeon who had to retrieve one or more of these devices in my career because they don't always stay where you want them, and which is incredibly nerve wracking for the people that have to put them in. If it doesn't look like it's gonna stay in there, then they get referred back for open surgery. But if the patient can take anticoagulation, then they can have an ablation, they can get this device called a Watchman device, and the patient can go on to get anticoagulation that the left atrial appendage smooths over. So then you're asking yourself, wait a minute, you just talked about this other procedure where you do the ablation and you put on the clip. Remember, as the patients get older and we start to do more things and the more holes we put in patients, the more complications that can occur, you know, we have a lot of options and that's why we have a group of people and not just me making decisions. Percutaneous closure of the left atrial appendage versus Coumadin, and this is incredibly important, was done, let's see, 5,000 patients. I think I have another slide on this. Um, the PROTECT AF trial, did I spell that right? Ah, oh, man, I would have picked that up if you didn't make me send in this talk yesterday. Sorry about that. Sorry about the typo. I'm incredibly embarrassed. And I'm being yelled at by people in the audience from all over Brooklyn. Um, 449 attempted, 41 failed. Okay, so that means that they couldn't put it in or they had a problem putting it in, so those patients have to go somewhere else. 408 were implanted, but only 86% of the patients stopped the Coumadin in 45 days. Okay, not 100%. So you still got 14% of the patients on Coumadin. But Coumadin's perfect, right? You guys all know. You put them on Coumadin, INR is perfect. It's a not issue. Has anybody read the right lower quadrant of this slide yet? During this trial, where people were monitored like crazy in order to find out the answer to this question, these patients only had a therapeutic INR based on the trial's specifics of 66%. And that is in keeping with the registries and all of you in the office and all of your patients and everybody. The only thing that we've seen that improves the INR target goals are when patients do it at home with their own machine. If you leave it up to us in the healthcare system, this is the results you're gonna get. Unfortunately, those are reality of life. That's why we're leaning so heavily on these DOACs. So what has come out in recent months and years is that the DOACs are not the same. Not at all. And it's incredibly important that we know that they are not the same. Even patients who have an INR that's out of the therapeutic range still do better than some patients that are on DOACs. Not consistently, but it's an interesting piece of information that you need to take with you. So the percutaneous closure for um, the prevention of stroke was so it was designed to be non-inferior artery. And in fact, the all strokes were less, and again, not dramatically less, but they were less, which means they were non-inferior. And all-cause mortality was less. And in these patients, stroke is, leads to death. We know that. So non-inferior, if you just put the, put the watchman in versus you just anticoagulate the patient and about 80, 85% of them can come off anticoagulation. But the, but the other side of the coin, of course, there's more to the story. What was that? There was, I can't remember the guy. There's always more to the story, right? So major bleeding, significant on both sides because major bleeding had to occur within the first 45 days. Hemorrhagic stroke dramatically increased in the control group that was taking Coumadin, but not zero in the intervention group. And that is the number one reason why we're all friends here. And that is the most important piece of information for this particular conference, which is, I am not making that decision. You have to make that decision. And that is a bear of a decision to make. You have a patient who suffered a complication in all likelihood of treatment or of their disease. And now you have to figure out 
what their risk is of treatment and their disease moving forward with regards to all of the options I've just laid out in front of you. And it is not clear, not at all, not in 2023, May 25th. Willie Venegas' birthday, by the way. If anybody out there knows my old friend from grade school, Willie Venegas. <clears throat> so that brings us to this trial, which you can see some people's names at the end, Dr. Greenberg and Dr. Yang. I think there's other people on the inside. If you take these patients and you combine the best that we have from cardiac surgery and electrophysiology cardiology, the patients have less atrial fibrillation at one to two years. We already talked about what happens later, but let's just focus on the positive, shall we? If you look at these studies, that at 12 months, 80% of the patients who had this hybrid procedure, 74 to 94% of the patients have, are out of AFib. And the residual AF burden is as high as 8.5% at two years, but as low as one to 2% at one year, right? So we already said from earlier that the less AFib you have, the less risk of stroke. We also said that patients who have this procedure, ablations, ablations, they need to be anticoagulated for three to two to three months, but maybe you could take them off anticoagulation. And this is actually the rub, what we talk about when I get these patients that come out of your unit with a bleed and you have to decide, can they take anticoagulation for two to three months? Or am I really not comfortable? Because if you cannot reasonably guarantee that the patient can take anticoagulation for two to three months, you will leave the patient in a state of increased risk of thromboembolic disease over not doing it because we've roughed up the inside of the heart, we've scratched up a bunch of vessels, and we need to anticoagulate them so that can heal. So if that is not available, we go in, left chest, we put a clip on the left atrial appendage, and we're done. Because the second the clip is deployed, the risk of a clot forming in the left atrial appendage drops. How much does it drop? I'll let you know, because that study is ongoing. But we all know that it's less than before the clip is placed. If 90% of the strokes develop in the left atrial appendage to a reasonable degree, and we can clip 95% of the appendage, we don't get 100 because there's a small important artery called the circumflex that's irritatingly in the way at times, then we've probably dropped your stroke risk definitely by 50%, but probably higher than that. But we don't have the data. So I can only tell you what I can tell you. The key is if they can take anticoagulation, we can do even better. And I am glad, again, for the third time today, that I don't have to make that decision, Tony. You guys have to make that decision. I'm very grateful. Yes, well, I'm throwing it on you because you invited me here and you're the one who took my money. Yes, you, Ilya, you do indeed, my friend. So the immediate need to stop anticoagulation, AFib with bleeding, placement of a left atrial appendage clip, stop anticoagulation, done. If they have a GI bleed, gastrointestinal bleed, those are the same thing, by the way, cerebral bleed, frequent falls, they age out of anticoagulation. That's what we do. And we have to tell the families, plain and simple, that the reality of this it has nothing to do with the cardiovascular implications of AFib, but it has everything to do to the cardioembolic implications of AFib. I believe very strongly after talking to patients that they have no clue about AFib, and I believe very strongly that myself 15 years ago also had no clue about AFib, and I'm in the business, so it's not unreasonable. So we have a lot of work to do educating the, our groups to how to do this. So the next patient group, they can, can be tolerated. Ilya is like, this patient is fine. They're going to be able to tolerate AFib. No, they'll be able to tolerate anticoagulation, no problem. We can place the Watchman device. We can do an ablation. 
or we can even go so far as to do an epicardial ablation and put on a clip or both or any combination thereof, they go on anticoagulation and everything's fine. As long as they don't wind up bleeding, everything's okay. And at 45 days by the rules, we can stop anticoagulation. But you know what happens? They don't. Because people are nervous and if they, if they go on the anticoagulation and they're okay, the patient's is not the issue, it's the family. They don't want them to have another stroke. They know the stroke was from this. They get nervous. They don't want it to, develop. and now you're arguing with them about what to do. We are in a slippery slope because we don't know the answers. They don't know the answers. And in the middle of all this is their family member that they love dearly and don't want to suffer any more debilitating injuries. So it's super complicated. But the patients get evaluated by TEE in the operating room. And if there's a clot there, we're done. We're done. We can't put a clip on that sucker. That's it. Can't put a watchman in it, can't manipulate it, can't do nothing. But if they can take anticoagulation, we can anticoagulate them for a couple of months, bring them back, try again. If they can't take anticoagulation, we say, we're sorry, and we're done. The eradication of atrial fibrillation, I believe very strongly, it may not be possible with the current understanding of atrial fibrillation any more than the eradication of coronary artery disease is possible by doing a fantastic coronary artery bypass grafting surgery, which our group does all the time. It's not necessarily going to fix it. Dr. Ree, who's kindly enough to be sitting in the audience, and I talk about this all the time. We, by definition, kick the can, right? That's our job. We want to say we are fixing things, but in reality, we're kicking the can. We're fixing, we're, we're not quite firefighters, but we're just kicking the can down the line for the next problem or complications of the vascular disease or whatever it happens to be. Because you can't eradicate this problem from every vessel in the body. You can only deal with the big problems. Rhythm control is critical, but we not, can't necessarily solve it. But immediate control of the appendage, and I'm gonna say it again, immediate control of the appendage for the stroke patient is absolutely a game changer. And being able to do that is a game changer. Immediate control of the appendage for someone who has to come off anticoagulation for any other reason, whether it be frequent falls, GI bleed, bleeds in the brain, urologic bleeding, whatever it happens to be, game changers. These are huge things that we can do immediately and take anticoagulation, which is a very risky prop proposition in a lot of these patients, out of the mix. There's a little thing that we haven't talked about, which is the ligament of Marshall. How many people in the room even know what that thing is? Me and three other people that I know. Four. So the ligament of Marshall is the vestigial left SVC that has now become a focus if you're in EP, of paroxysmal AFib. If you're in medical school, it's an annoying tag that they put on so you have to get a question wrong in your anatomy class. For us, it is an emotionally scarring physical structure that is behind the heart, behind the left atrial appendage. And in order for us to get it, we have to get to it before the clip is placed so we're not manipulating the clip you got the pulmonary artery and the aorta sitting right there. And we've got three people in that room, which are also in this room, doing things like, uh, uh, because it's a very nerve wracking procedure to get this sucker, unless it's just beautifully sitting there. But if we can take it out, it really, 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 really helps because this is a structure that cannot be taken out any other way. I don't even know if I want to do another one, Joe. I, I would really prefer not to, you know? Yeah, he, Joe doesn't want to do it again either. But if we can take it out, it's tremendous because there are electrical signals skirting around the back of the heart that go through this structure. So you guys have all learned something completely random about the ligament of Marshall, and you never have to hear about it or think about it again. But there's no question that if you took 10,000 patients and they were able to take anticoagulation, that the convergent hybrid ablation of the heart to control atrial fibrillation is the best way to control it. Then, five or 10 years down the line, EP can come in and 
touch them up because it's going to come back. I think the data pretty much all shows that. So <clears throat> this is the face of a card that we are in the process of getting through administration. It's it's taken three years. We all, I think in another four years, we'll be able to send it out because you can see that the attorneys and the administration have to read all these words to make sure that they're in keeping with uh, the council. That's why we kept the words pretty simple. The top on the left is the watchman device. The fabric part is the part that sticks into the heart. The metal parts are the part that stick into the appendage. And the clip that you see here is closed. When we squeeze the handle, these two sides open up, we lay it over the appendage and then deploy it. And then on TE, we check that it's closed. I'm lucky enough to be involved with, oh no, actually this is the wrong slide. None of these people. Just kidding, just kidding. Um, Dr. Greenberg, you know very well, and Ro Patel from the EP department, uh, Zygmunt Golick in the back, Alan Matia, and myself. We we do these procedures along with our PAs. I think Joe's done the most. Joe, you should be up here. See, now I have guilt. Oh, God, I feel terrible. Joe's, Joe's actually done more than probably all the people up there. <laughs> so his face should be up there, and I apologize it profusely from the bottom of my heart. Uh, Jessica's done a number of them. Joe's definitely done more. But I think that the message is fairly clear, and I appreciate you guys listening, and I'll take any questions. Thank you for that very uh, illuminating and uh, entertaining uh, talk, Ben, as always. Uh, questions? Uh, Eric, to start off. Hi. Uh, are you advocating that everyone should have anyone with atrial fibrillation should have the left atrial appendage removed, even if there is no clot? And I have a sample case to bring up. Sure, sure. So if there is a clot, it cannot be touched except during open heart surgery, where we would be clamping the aorta, physically cutting it open, taking the clot out, washing out the atrium, and then closing it. So that being said, if there's a clot, anticoagulate the patients if there's no other issues and and then you can reevaluate them by TEE. But in terms of whether all patients in atrial fibrillation should be evaluated by our multidisciplinary team or N multidis a multidisciplinary team, the answer is yes, because if they are in a situation where they can undergo these procedures and they are relatively safe procedures. I mean, no, no surgery is safe, safe, but compared to some of the stuff that I do and that we do in the heart surgery world, it's, you know, it's a completely different, different thing. I think that the patients can be evaluated because if we do this first, and I'm going to use the example of cabbage versus stenting, if we do the bypass first and the patients come back with problems, then stenting is a very reasonable thing because the risk benefit is such. If we do the hybrid convergent atrial fibrillation procedure first. We remove the left atrial appendage. We get the ligament of Marshall, and we get the patient in a state where right then and there, maybe 80 to 90%, they'll be out of AFib at one to two years. When they get a recurrence, and they probably will, then EP can go in and they'll have a lot less work to do. Because if we're standing in the left atrial appendage like this, with two ways out that way and two ways out that way, and they're going in with this little piece of wire trying to burn this whole area, it's very difficult. What we do is we burn the whole roof off. We burn the sides off, but there's always gonna be areas that can grow in between, and they have this miraculous computer-based mapping program, and they can go in and touch it up, and that's how we do the procedure from the beginning, and that's how they can do it at the end. So if you're asking me how to approach the patients with AFib, I think if you can't get them out of AFib with medicine, and they go back in and they're symptomatic, you know, we'll be happy to take a look at them and we'll tell you what we all think. And it doesn't matter. We all feel the same way. We don't want to cut people open if we don't have to. One of the pa <clears throat> one of my patients had a fib, uh, two ablations. Second one was successful. Uh, echoes were normal. Should he have had the atrial appendage uh, clipped or leave well enough alone since he's doing well? Hmm. So I never, I never Monday morning quarterback because I don't want anybody to do it to me. Um, but. <laughs> at this point, right, moving forward, without scarring in the pericardium, without um, concern for left lung adherence, if the patient can undergo a convergent 
procedure, moving forward, you will be able to control the AFib better over time. Now, it depends on their age, comorbidities, and all the usual stuff, but that's really the bottom line. So you would recommend that then? Okay, thank you. Sure. I got the audience like stuck uh, with our people. So. Dr. Reed. I, I can't help myself, but uh, <laughs> with a 15% um, a benefit, which is, is that accurate? A 15% benefit from that um, graph that you showed, uh, you know, obviously you have to weigh the risks benefits for all of these separate procedures. Um, I have two questions. One is what are the complications that can occur with each of those procedures? It looks like there's a lot of sharp metal there. Does that ever penetrate the heart at some point or develop clot on its own? Uh, the clip, um, what, what are the complications with that? And, uh, if you had to have it done, would you have it done surgically or would you have one of those, uh, watchmans or the atrial clip? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, so I'll take all the different parts of your question uh, two weeks from next Thursday, and I want to thank you for your question. No, no, no. So um, in terms of what I would do, um, I think that if I was symptomatic based on the statistics, knowing that it's going to recur and seeing what I've seen, which is multiple patients come in with multiple ablations, I would have a convergent first, and then I would never go back to the surgeon and get touched up. My family has no coronary disease, so I wouldn't likely complicate my future with regards to intrapericardial operations. I don't have any aortic disease. So in my case, that's that's the truth. Of course, if these patients are going to go for surgery, you get a evaluation of their coronaries by CT angio or a cardiac catheterization. And if they have that disease, then you follow down that pathway as well. And we take care of it at the same time. So all very good questions, but it's it really depends on what is the chance of you having to go back in the pericardium with this patient? Now, in terms of the risks, I would prefer not to speak directly about the statistics of the watchmen, except to say that there are thousands and thousands of them put in, and they do get dislodged. There's a failure of placement sometimes, and then removal can be a bit of a challenge. But overwhelmingly, it's a very, very safe procedure, both of them with risks of death that is way less than a half a percent. Now, regarding the left atrial appendage clip part of the procedure, we have done over 330 procedures, and we've had to do a thoracotomy, a thoracotomy to control bleeding on the left side in four cases. All of the cases, interestingly enough, were related to patients that had a little bit of scarring, very, very thin, frail tissue, very, very thin, frail patients. And the better part of Valor was to go in and control the bleeding before the patients had hemodynamic complications. But they, they didn't die from this. They just wound up with a small incision on the side, which is the way we did these procedures initially. So the complications of the procedures still exist, and I tell the patients that exact number. But the reality of it is that the overwhelming benefit of the procedure, even if you have to do a thoracotomy, is still enormous if they, you know, have a reasonable life to live moving forward. So I, I certainly uh, think it's valuable. I do have a question, Ben. Yeah. So does the configuration of an FAT appendage, whether it's cauliflower or lobster, uh, matter for watchman device? You do the same evaluation of the CT, CTA 3D configuration uh, modeling before, you know, just like you do for clipping? Yeah, the Golic Lobster device, I'm sorry, the Golic Lobster uh, appendage. <laughs> so he, what you what you describe is exactly the problem, is that the in order to get a device through the FDA, you basically have to have one device, right? You start with one device. Could they have gotten five devices through the FDA? Probably, but it would have taken 10 times the amount of time. So they got one device and one size fits all. If you've ever looked at any human being, you realize one size fits all in no way, shape or form. No shirts, no shoes, no ties, no nothing, hats, nothing. So this doesn't work at all either. So when the patients are evaluated initially by ECHO and then by TEE and by CAT scan, we send it the ones that look a little funny to the company and they can clearly tell us this is not going to be a watchman case. They, they know if you have a bilobed left atrial appendage that bifurcates early, that each of the lobes are, are less than half the size of the watchman device and you can't get it nestled in, you're, you're going to create a problem. So they don't, we don't even move forward with those. So we do have that preoperative evaluation and you make a very good point, but that's why 
we have these other options. And so the patients come in, we say the minimally invasive, the least painful, the most likely for success, and then we kind of move forward and give them all the options as unfortunately in some patients we're not able to do the most minimally invasive procedure. Great. So in those unfortunate cases that the watchman dislodged after deployment, do they have to undergo open car surgery to retrieve them? They do. Um, most of them, you do have to go in, um, and obviously, it's not just a watchman device. There were multiple devices that came down the line, the Lariat device and a bunch of other ones that were done and have been done in other places um, that I was involved with from the surgical side. Our objective going in is twofold, obviously, keep, save the patient, number one, and number two, um, go and fix the problem, right? The patient went to have their atrium, atrial appendage removed. So we oftentimes will go in through the left atrial appendage if it's simple. And when I say simple, um, I have been involved in more complex cases where the device dislodged, it went through, now it's in the ventricle, it's caught up in the mitral valve. It's a super complicated situation. Um, that's very rare. Most of the time, it's just sort of sitting in the atrium. We go to the operating room, you open up the appendage, you grab it, you pull it out, close the appendage with a piece of felt, and you get out of there. Um, and as I said, you know, the obvious advantage of doing these cases in a hybrid room with a multidisciplinary team is that there's no surprise when somebody is needed to come in. We all know the patients, we all know the case. We are aware that these things are gonna happen. In the hospitals where they don't have cardiac surgery backup or they're attempting to do some of these complex advanced procedures in a basement corner lab where the heart lung machine can't come in for my colleagues from the perfusion group um, and what have you, you create, a, you create a problem that you don't have. The advantage of us having two hybrid rooms is we can get the hybrid room and do these cases and get them done. So there's an enormous advantage of, of being able to do that and have the team to, uh, to address these problems sort of in, in advance and the likelihood and evaluate the risk. Great, thank you, Ron. Uh, two hopefully quick questions. What is the age where you age out of anticoagulation? I think that uh, in my grandmother's case, it was about 82. Uh, she fell twice in the house. Um, and obviously, the first time they fall, we all suffer from these two incredible dangerous things. One is called optimism and one is called stupidity. So our optimism that she was never going to fall again and not hit her head and her stupidity not realizing that she's definitely going to fall again because she had already fallen multiple times and never told us, right? So the reality of it is that you want to catch them before then. But as with older people that get into their first car accident in their 70s, Patients that fall for the first time have never fallen. I mean, I'm sure our neurologic colleagues can address that far better than me. I just know it personally from my family. These are incidences that happen to all of us, and we know these are a marker for some change, and that we have to address that change directly. So that's that's how I would approach that. Okay. Yes. Could I make a comment? So some of the uh, neurological literature, short literature, mentioned actually for elderly to fall, they have to fall almost every every day to justify not to anticoagulate this patient for AFib. But that's for statistics. If a, if a patient fall, break her neck, that's the end of story, one. So you don't need to fall every day to have a bad outcome. So that's what I want to. And the bathroom is the most dangerous place, yeah. which is a place that you have to go at least once a day, that, I mean, in my life. When you spoke of serious pericardial cardial effusion, was this something hemorrhagic while on anticoagulation or something post-ablation where there was irritation of the uh, heart membrane? I'm sorry, say again? You mentioned during one of the atrial fibrillation trials that serious pericardial effusion was one of the, um, one of the uh, adverse effects. Did this pericardial effusion occur while they're on anticoagulation, so it's hemorrhagic fluid, or was it post ablation such that there was they irritation? separated them out? I don't believe they, they separated them out. So I don't I don't know. I don't have that data. But they they were just present. They were just present. And and remember, if we do an ablation, um, or we do coronary intervention, and blood gets into the pericardium, it's exquisitely irritating, and that irritation does not often show up on CT scan. And then we get in there, and that's when the team starts to get that oogie feeling when we're trying to get into the 
pericardium from the left chest and we don't see the heart moving the way we like to and we start to get a little bit of a oogie feeling because the, you know that happens anteriorly as well as through a thoracotomy um simply because there's scarring i want to actually echo again the the feeling that you mentioned that the multidisciplinary team collaboration is so important on, on evaluating this patient so we truly appreciate your presence at our request anytime and so is rob you know our vascular team and and uh you know Dr. Papantakis as well, all the time. So we're, we have a multidisciplinary team uh, for the heart, for the brain, and for the vasculature all the time. So it's wonderful, we are blessed for this. Um, you, uh, you mentioned, Ben, there the, for the clip, uh, clipped uh, left appendage patient, they have these reactions. And so, so, it, so the function of the left atrial appendage is what is a function as a sensor for the heart? The function of the left atrial appendage, just like for the, for the, for the append is appendix, is evaluating volume status, and it and, and the neurohumeral effects of distension uh, carries out. Actually, interestingly enough, when patients go into AFib, so follow me for one second for a, a point of interesting education, which is that if you have a patient who is in sinus rhythm and the atrium squeezes and the left atrial appendage squeezes, and then they go into AFib. The left atrium dilates, and now it's distended. The body says, oh, I'm now distended. I have to start of diurese. But we know that, especially in patients with left ventricular hypertrophy, diuresis of patients in AFib with LVH and poor left ventricular compliance can kill them. But that's what your body does. And these are some of the occasional secondary effects of multiple conditions in the body of which we all know them that can lead to a spiraling and death and that's why it's really particularly interesting how afib does not do what people think it did it's not something very simple it's super complicated and when we start cutting pieces off it gets even more complicated so but it's basically a volume status gauge gotcha thank you all right so one more Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I think you alluded a little bit in this previous answers about other devices. Um, I think you mentioned the Lariat. Um, I don't know, is it used anymore? Because I thought it had really higher complications uh, compared to. Uh, yeah, it, it did. We, we don't, we're not putting it anymore here, but uh, is it off the market? I don't, I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure it's been taken off the market. Um, very, everybody wants to know, it's, it's a really cool idea. So you go into the heart, you go across the septum, you stick a magnet into the left atrial appendage and you push it out. Then you go on the other side and you have another magnet. And with these two magnets that, ma that marry, you stick a wire right through the middle. And after you stick a wire through the middle, you put a, a device down the wire that you poke through the, the left, left chest and you just snare the, the, the uh, appendage. Now, whether you have a cauliflower or lobster or a chicken wing, it's like night and day. So that's one of the reasons why it didn't work that well. But when they tented it out uh, at a hosp former hospital, previous job I was at, they tented it out in a 85 year old lady. It just goes right through the, right through the wall because their 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 heart is weak. Went right through the wall, and we came in, rushed in, and you know, and did the whole thing. The other problem with it is that if the there's any scarring, um, then you can't get around it. Whereas the watchman, even if there's a little bit of scarring, as long as you can get it in place um, and get it to seat in there nicely, even with a little bit of scarring, you can actually still accomplish the goal. Thank you. Sure. Great talk. Thank you so much, Thank man. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.